Welcome to the HR Think Tank, a podcast that uncovers the power a trusted workforce has on team performance, culture, and morale. We gather insights from experts, business leaders, and HR professionals to help you lead your team. Here's your host, Kai no, CEO and co-founder of Verify Now. Have you ever felt that your organization could give to charitable causes in a more impactful way? We chat about the role of corporate social responsibility and how it impacts employee engagement and workplace culture. Our guests have developed a platform to give global workplaces the power to connect their people to each other through purpose and to make a culture of community and giving a central part of the employee experience. Crowned by the World Economic Forum in 2018 as the new global champion in innovation, this platform stands out because their software has been designed for both employees and program administrators, making it easier to make a difference. On today's episode, we chat to co-founders of Catalyzer, Angela Kwan and Ivy Robinson on the opportunities and challenges of corporate social responsibility. With impressive backgrounds in law, tech, education and not-for-profit, these co-founders started Catalyzer, a social enterprise based in Australia, to increase workplace giving by creating a digital platform for organisations and their staff to engage and impact charitable partners. Welcome to the show, Angela and Ivy. Thanks for having us, Kai. Great to have you both on the show and appreciate that you can come on board and chat about this important topic, corporate social responsibility. So let's start off with uh, talking about the history of corporate social responsibility and how it's evolved um, over the last number of decades. Sure. So firstly, corporate social responsibility is a big area and it's really about who a company is and how it does business. And it refers to the degree of responsibility that a business has to everyone and everything it impacts. So that includes customers, employees, shareholders, local communities and the environment. And in terms of its history, CSR has a long history, but some of its biggest moments span back to the important role that businesses played supporting communities after the war. So, you know, after something like that happens in the world, corporates, businesses, employers had a real big role to play. And CSR's model has had a continuous evolution since then. And really it's about how companies are and brands in our lives interplay with the issues that are happening today. And so we're talking about how companies are responding to climate change, um, how they're helping to progress Indigenous reconciliation, or say how internal diversity and inclusion policies responding to social movements that are happening right now, like Me Too or Black Lives Matter. Can you talk to me about the the different types of uh, corporate social responsibility or, or throughout this episode, we're probably just going to refer to as CSR, but the different types of CSR activities, initiatives that organisations can roll out? Yes, there are so many. So like many aspects of HR and organisational behaviour, the practice of CSR actually reflects a really wide spectrum of different activities and initiatives. And this is a function of many things like, say, how long a business has been practising CSR, how embedded CSR is in their DNA, budget, of course, uh, and demand from customers and employees. But CSR can include lots of different things, um, employee giving activities like volunteering, workplace giving, uh, fundraising. We see a lot of disaster relief, particularly at the moment, um, corporate matching, pro bono, in-kind giving. These are all activities which the Catalyzer platform manages for our clients. But CSR as a broad umbrella can also encompass things like business and human rights, sustainability initiatives, we're seeing a lot of that at the moment, and even cause-related marketing. How does uh, a corporate's um, social responsibility program vary depending on on their approach? So what I'm referring to is, you know, there is the partnership approach with the charity partners uh, versus employee giving programs, but then there are also organisation-driven initiatives versus employee-driven initiatives. How does that vary in terms of success and engagement for employees? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because every different company has a different understanding of what CSR is. And then on top of that, within a company, their understanding of, or practice of CSR is on a spectrum. So they're changing their understanding as they get more experienced. So in terms of partnership approach and employee giving programs, it's it's hard to define. It's not so much one or the other. They're just different approaches. So an example of um, a long-term partnership approach is something where it's really mutually beneficial. So that's where the business has a really, really deep understanding and a, often a long-term commitment 
to a charity and the social change that they're trying to move the needle on, um, but also where the charity has a really deep understanding of the business value that their partner needs to see from the engagement because it's not from the goodness of the business's heart that they're getting involved. They really want to see some outcomes for their business, whether that's on the employee engagement side, whether that's about helping their brand, whether that is, you know, wanting to um, uphold certifications like B Corp or other commitments to their stakeholders. Um, and so a really good example, I might just talk about one that I think most people will recognise is the corporate partnership between, say, Woolworths and Oz Harvest. Um, now, we often see these two brands next to each other. We see them on trucks. We see them at the store. They're very aligned. Um, and in this partnership, everyone wins. So, for example, Oz Harvest programs, they're supplied with food. On the Woolworths side, they're minimising wastage. And for customers, every customer gets good feels from shopping at a store that cares, which, of course, is so important for, for Woolies in terms of creating brand equity and loyalty. Yeah. And so you can really see this, um, how a long-term partnership that is aligned with business and the brand can really have really huge outcomes for a social cause or charity. Um, however, having said this, sometimes these big partnerships, these big national partnerships can fail to engage a really key stakeholder group in the business, and that's the employees. So whilst I work at Woolies, I might know we have a great partnership with Oz Harvest. What are the opportunities that I have as an employee to engage with it? And that's where we see a lot of the employee giving programs, which as their name suggests, are about employees getting involved. What we can see is that often companies that have really successful programs have a combination. And that's the same with organisation driven initiatives versus employee driven initiatives. Um, again, not so much one versus the other, but in Catalyzer's experience, some of the most impactful programs are where there's a bit of column A and a bit of column B. So um, I guess it's really important that an organization's program has top-down organization-driven organization strategic uh, initiatives, um, yeah. and that is because it has to align with the business mission. But what's super oh. important is at the same time, the voices and opinions of individual employees need to be welcomed and listened to. And I think, you know, Kai, your audience in HR, um, employee experience is really not about what the company says their culture is, but what the employee feels mm. the culture mm -hmm. is. And so being heard and valued is so critical to that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, that, that brings us to our, our next question, which is why CSR matters. And so I want to ask Angela, what, what are some of the key benefits of organizations having a CSR program and what challenges do they face, not only implementing one, but maintaining one? Yeah, Kai. So I think the a starting point is that CSR programs are an investment and they mm. have to be assessed and implemented strategically to maximize the benefits. And that means both the company at a strategic level and the leaders of the company have to have the right mindset. And so in terms of for the company overall, I think the, the concept of a CSR program, it should be valued not as a cost center, but as something that can drive tangible business benefit and therefore is aligned with the overall commercial strategies of the company. So in terms of benefits, there's some obvious benefits, um, such as what Ivy's already mentioned in terms of brand building brand equity. There's a lot of studies that show that consumers would actually pay more to buy from a good company or a company that has a great reputation. And then, so that's, that's one aspect. In terms yeah. of other kind of tangible uh, commercial benefits, um, one really interesting development in CSR is how it's affecting fundraising and investor mindsets. So a lot mm. of investors are actually taking into consideration the CSR programs of their investee companies and holding that accountability. For example, fund managers are often asking companies in their portfolio to report and show um, what they're doing in terms of CSR. We're also seeing that for a lot of big projects or even government tenders, suppliers are being evaluated on their CSR programs. So it's not just mm. about having a program, but having that accountability and that reporting. I guess the final big benefit that Ivy alluded to was the employee experience and how a CSR program that's integrated with business processes and culture can have huge benefits to growing employee experience in letting staff know 
um, that the company is connected with the community. There's a tremendous sense of pride, inclusiveness, and purpose that leads to a more productive and engaged workforce. Um, and that can help with attracting and retaining top talent. One mm -hmm. good example is uh, we're seeing a real shift in the generation of um, employees. So a lot of studies showing millennial sentiment and, and getting top young talent that the purpose and the fact that a company is connected with CSR is actually influencing those mm. recruitment decisions of um, the younger workforce. And so look, there's some of the key benefits, but let's talk about some of the challenges of implementing one and maintaining some, because, you know, it's, it's all good and well to talk about the, uh, the, the benefits, but we've got to be realistic. There is a, a, some challenges with it. Can you outline some of those key challenges? So I think one of the key challenges is um, that mindset. And I think for a lot of companies, especially corporate leaders, they feel like that they're leaders in a commercial sense and maybe so it's not their place for a company or them as leaders to voice mm. opinions mm. about, say, social or community issues. Now, what's interesting is I think the new form of leadership and how we expect our leaders to act is to be authentic and empathetic mm. and engaged with um, topical issues. So a really interesting Edelman Trust Survey, that's an annual survey that's, um, that is conducted by Edelman, showed that 76% of employees actually want CEOs and their leaders to show more leadership and engagement on social causes that lead to positive mm. social change. So I think one of the challenges, firstly, is to kind of um, erase that misconception that business has no place in kind of these social debates and, and, and social issues. So that's one side. And then from a practical implementation side, um, there's a challenge that CSR programs need to be properly resourced and therefore there needs to be some kind of commercial investment um, in terms of um, resources, in terms of budget, in terms of personnel and strategic focus for CSR programs to be viable. That requires devotion of time and consistent um, monitoring and also engagement. So I think the, the understanding that it's a long-term investment, that it has to evolve, and it's not like you, you pay or set up a program once and it's on autopilot. Like a lot of um, initiatives in a corporate, it needs constant nurturing, monitoring, and evolution as well. Talk to me about the CSI impact on company brand and performance. What does it do? So I think um, we all want to buy and work for the good guys. And I think with social media and news, it's very easy to um, track and see the reputation of brands and companies. Studies have shown that you know 80% of customers, for example, would prefer to buy from corporates that have corporate social responsibility or um, business models that support the community. And then other studies have also shown, for example, 41% of how a person feels about a company or brand is based on their CSR practices. So for brands and, 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 and performance of companies, there is now a direct correlation between a company's CSR brand and also their bottom line and how they're respected and treated and differentiated. Um, and so in terms of accountability, how do we measure CSR performance? I think another really yeah. interesting development is that there are now increasingly frameworks and standards for companies to benchmark themselves. One really interesting study that I came across was, for example, during the global financial crisis, um, someone did a measure about companies, certain companies stopped investments in CSR as a cost saving mm -hmm. and other companies continued to invest in CSR initiatives. And when the performance of that company was tracked, it, it showed that the companies that continue to invest in CSR programs and engage with the community actually recovered faster and performed better than those after a crisis because they were able to protect and grow their brand and reputation in the community. They were mm. able to increase customer loyalty. And also from a fundraising point of view, a lot of funders do evaluate companies based on that. And uh, they, they actually found it easier to raise capital and perform after. So I think it's really interesting times with COVID. A lot of businesses are going through um, challenging times, thinking about cost savings. So I would say mm -hmm. that CSR is an area, if it's integrated in your strategy, that um, companies shouldn't really um, stop doing and that it does have real long-term implications on brand and performance. So as a business owner or as an executive, selecting the right charity partners is quite important, particularly if you've got a big focus on CSR. 
and, and, and you know, I guess the, the follow-on results from having a good CSR program. Um, Ivy, I might ask you the question, how, how should um, charity partners be evaluated? How do you know that you've selected the right partner for you? Sure. Well, it's a big question, Kai. Um, but I think for companies that are wading into the CSR space for the first time, I feel that it can be paralyzing to choose where you want to start, who you want to support, whichever market you're in. Catalyzer has customers around the world. You know, we always recommend that they first go to the charity regulator if there is one in their space um, and ensure that anyone you're considering is is verified and has all of the right um, certifications in terms of that regulatory environment. Um, so that's the first thing you want to do. Then I think it's really about understanding what cause area is going to resonate with your business. So we've seen many, many different approaches to CSR across our client base and across um, companies that we've worked with. Um, and many have come to us saying, we have so many charity partners we don't know how to group them. We don't know how to report on them. We can't really tell a sensible story about the impact that we're making because we have this really diverse, very disparate group of charity partners. And so often what they've asked us to do is help them to distill that down and make that more strategic so that the cause areas that they're involved with can be long-term and they can, even though they might switch out the individual charity partners underneath those cause areas, they're still aligning cause areas to their business mission. And so what we say to many of our clients is, you know, who are your big partners? So do you have three to five national partners that are there for the long term? And then do you have some that reflect the values that are important to your employees? Do you have local um, causes, local community organisations that are being driven by your employee interests. It's really important to harness the passion um, that the employees are bringing to the table because they're the ones who want to get engaged. And we have seen that these two approaches can really coexist very harmoniously to have your big strategic charity partners as well as your um, employee suggested charity partners. Um, in terms of how to choose them, um, you know, you can always come to a team like Catalyzer um, with yeah. the expertise to help you do that. There's so many different other great people, um, great consultants that can support. I think talking to peers is very important. So within the CSR professional space, um, there's a lot of peer engagement for people in similar roles across different businesses to share best practice and to share experiences. Um, and then also I think it's extremely important to speak to the charities themselves. So I come from the charity sector myself. I think it's a really important thing that a lot of corporates might forget to do mm -hmm. um, in terms of their selection process. They need to get to know these charities and let the charities themselves explain what their work is, what their impact is, what their models are, how they can work with different corporates, um, there's no one better to explain that than, than the charities themselves. Um, and I think that's the start of a very important aspect, which is the relationship building between the charity and the corporate directly. Okay. Well, on the flip side, how, how did charity partners um, choose the right corporate partners? You know, is there an imbalance in terms of the power dynamic? You know, on the one side, one's got the employee giving program have got these initiatives on the other side, you're the recipient. Um, how would you help charity partners choose the right corporate partners and can they say no? Yes, right. So it's also got to be similarly strategic from the charity side in terms of selecting which corporate partners they want to work with. Firstly, there has to obviously be a brand and values alignment. A particular cause, a particular charity might have entire industries that wouldn't be appropriate for them to align with. They might have entire areas of the corporate world that are just not going to support what they're doing. Similarly, it's really important that um, we understand the competitive landscape, for want of a better mm. word, when it comes to charities um, getting the attention of corporates. Um, 
you know, it can be really difficult for particularly smaller or newer charities to get time to meet and speak with corporate partners, which is part of the design of Catalyzer software actually was to try and democratize that access into corporates. So Catalyzer's software um, has been designed so that we're giving all charities, regardless of their size or their age, um, the same amount of real estate and access into our corporate partners um, as the really, really large established household name charities. Um, so, and that was a very important part of what we were trying to do at Catalyzer. It was about enabling charities that perhaps don't have big corporate partnerships teams or don't have big marketing teams. How do they get in front of some of the largest corporates in the country to explain what it is that they're doing that's different? And so for any charity partner that does want to get on Catalyzer, is it as simple as popping on your website, um, reading the information and then applying to be part of Catalyzer? How, how does that work? Sure. So we're working with charities um, around the world. Um, our clients are in 15 countries around the world. So our charities on our platform are really um, geographically dispersed. And yes, it's really as easy as that. So they hop onto catalyzer.com. Um, there's a section for charities. And they can read a bit of information, there's a couple of FAQs, but then they can get in touch with us directly. And then a member of the team will arrange to meet. Our goal is to really understand what it is that they're doing that's different. We want to get to the heart mm -hmm. of what the problem is, is that they're trying to solve so that when we work with our corporates and help them respond to needs, we can really make very specific recommendations um, whether it might be a small charity, a large charity, an overseas charity, um, we want to really help our clients understand what the options are. Early on, Ivy talked about a really great example of a CSR partnership, and that was in Woolies and Oz Harbors. Mm. Um, Angela, I'm wondering if you could share any other examples of really good CSR programs that people can look up. So um, I think um, a lot of corporates have um, long-term, your, your point about kind of long-term mentoring and um, enrichment programs with charities. I think a lot of our professional service firms, be it lawyers or accounting firms, including some of Catalyzer's clients, have these great kind of skilled volunteering programs. And so those programs involve, it could be secondments. Um, we've, we've got clients, uh, law firms, for example, that second their staff for extended periods. It could be six months. It could be a whole year in a community legal center where they are using those legal skills, um, being embedded as part of the team of their um, charity partner. Um, and so other examples are, it could be on a project basis where say mm. consultants go in and help charities with a strategy piece, charities to uh, look at their tech um, tech services or their tech operations. So companies um, or even leaders within companies joining boards of charities, becoming mentors mm. to leaders within charities. Um, I think professional services um, organizations, a lot of the law firms and accounting firms have great examples of these um, kind of skilled-based volunteering long-term initiatives. So talking about great partnerships, uh, you both have very unique backgrounds. And as co-founders, you guys came together to start Catalyzer. Can you just give me some insights into how you guys got to know each other and how, how you ended up co-founding Catalyzer together? Angela and I have actually known each other since we were very young, so since we are in primary school. Um, and, you know, this Catalyzer has been, I guess, a journey that we've been on for about five years now. However, you know, our partnership goes back so much longer than that. And um, whilst our professional careers really diverged, so Angela, she went off to Harvard and she did law um, across Asia, um, had a great career, lots of big corporates. I um, went in a different direction and went into social work um, and worked for different not-for-profits and charities in the UN around um, Asia, around the Pacific. And I think what is common to both of us was that we have always um, built our careers with this social lens, which is we've always wanted to do things that um, the end goal wasn't the job itself. We wanted to be part of 
something else, something bigger, something um, that contributed to the change in the world. And so we've always had that common thread um, ever mm. since we've known each other. And um, that has really come to life through the Catalyzer adventure. Uh, I, I share the same sentiments with you. I think um, may, maybe it's a generational thing as well. Maybe it's, it's an awareness thing, but it's just been great talking to, to you both about it and then seeing the passion that you have for the for your own organization, but also the impact that you can have for all these other organizations, not only in Australia, but around the world. So, so thanks for sharing that, that story. I want to talk about the future of CSR now. So Ivy, how is it changing? Um, how is it evolving? How are charity partners affected during economic downturns or right now, you know, while the pandemic is still raging? Yeah. Look, CSR is a really fast moving space and, companies are increasingly being judged on their decisions in this space and their performance mm. when it comes to CSR. So how do they treat their employees? What's their stance on social issues, as Angela mentioned earlier? What, you know, what are the ethics of their supply chain? So CSR is good business and more and more it's an essential part of business. Um, and what we're seeing is companies moving up the CSR spectrum with much more sophisticated programs that are holistic. And so they are including a wider range of different activities. So once upon a time, they used to maybe just offer one type of activity, for example, workplace giving, but we're not seeing yeah. that very much anymore. We're seeing so many companies starting to offer not just workplace giving, but volunteering, pro bono projects, sustainability pledges, ways for their employees to get involved across the spectrum. And yeah. It is this diversity of activities that provides something for everyone. And that is what's driving higher engagement. Because if you're only offering one thing, that's just not going to fit everybody's idea of how they want to help mm -hmm. or how they want to give back. And so we're seeing a lot of the much more successful, much more impactful programs, bringing in different elements of ways to get involved because not everybody wants to give with their time, nor does everybody want to give with their money. Um, and so yeah. how do we understand what our employees want to do and provide them with opportunities that reflect that? So Catalyzer um, currently offers our clients a menu of 10 different giving modules. That's 10 different ways that you can um, offer your employees opportunities to get involved and we're continuously adding to that menu to evolve to to respond to the evolving needs of our clients so what we can see mm. is corporates are thinking of new ways to engage their people they don't want to keep it the same they want to just keep mixing it up um, and they want to be on the front foot of innovation yeah. Um, yeah. and and that's affecting charities as well because charities on the other side they also need to evolve then um, yeah, in, in yeah, terms of yeah. keeping up with partnerships. And it can be challenging for small organisations, small grassroots organisations who don't have a lot of resources, um, you know, where every cent is going to their program delivery because what charities are being asked to do is increasingly improve their tech enablement, you know, increasingly come up with innovative opportunities to connect with employees um, and also we're seeing different trends that charities need to respond to. So on the corporate side, the employee side, what we know is donors want a feedback loop. They want to know that their $5, their $100, their two hours of volunteering, they want to know that that contributed to something. So they want the feedback loop. But having said that, they also have very short attention spans, as we all do these days. And so yeah. they want you know, short, snappy videos. They want little text messages. Um, you know, we don't want to see the, you know, what we might used to receive, the pages and pages of direct mail that we used to get yeah. from charity partners. Yeah. Um, so donors it's, are saying it's important. I want to know where my money went. I want to know how I helped. But do it in a way that responds to how I want to receive information. And, look, charities have an ever-increasing choice of tech partners to work with. We see that because we see so many charities coming to Catalyzer um, because of certain things that we do. And, and some of those include um, the fact that we don't charge charities any fees. Um, we don't take a percentage of their donations. And yet at the same time, we give them visibility. We help give them access into corporates. And, you know, some of the yeah. biggest, most active corporates in the CSR space 
Um, and so there's so many benefits, but charities also need the, I guess, capability and capacity to yeah. assess who to work with. And when all your staff are out at the coalface working with communities, it's very hard for these kind of corporate functions. Um, and mm -hmm. so, look, it's it's a big changing space. We see a lot of challenges both on the corporate side and the charity side. Um, yeah. But, you know, people, organisations like Catalyzer, we're, we're, we're here to try and support both sides of the yeah. partnership. So it, it's we know what Catalyzer does and the great work that you're both doing, you and your team. Um, what's on the cards for Catalyzer in the future. Can you give us some insights into your, your, your roadmap or ambitions for the future? We would be wonderful if you could share it. So um, for us, Kai, we've um, started off in Australia, but I guess our ambition mm. has always been to be a global company. The CSR movement is really a global movement. Australia and Australian companies um, are really at the forefront of a lot of these initiatives. I would say particularly in areas like diversity and inclusion, um, Indigenous reconciliation and even sustainability. Australian companies and employees are really at the forefront. Uh, but I guess Catalyzer's our vision was really to grow and support um, other corporates around the world. And a lot of our Australian companies also have staff and offices in multi multiple jurisdictions. So I guess the vision of Catalyzer is to grow our footprint and to be able to scale and support um, more companies and more charities around the world. This year was a big milestone for us in terms of Catalyzer's impact. Um, we reached $15 million of um, impact facilitated through Catalyzer in terms of donations and volunteering um, uh, talent given by facilitated through the platform. Um, wow. And so our vision really is let's 10 exit um, in the next few years and let's um, be able yeah. to spread this um, message and facilitate more impact and engagement beyond Australia. Yeah, that, that's, that's brilliant. And Ivy, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah. Well? Yeah. Look, I mean, Angela's covered a lot, but I think for us it's um, just continuing to grow the value that we offer to our businesses. So mm -hmm. um, as we mentioned, you know, CSR programs are constantly evolving and they're maturing and becoming more mm -hmm. and more sophisticated by, you know, each month. Um, and so in terms of our product roadmap, in terms of, um, our services, we want to continue to evolve with our customers and to, okay. and to take them on that journey. So wherever they've joined us, we want to be able to help them grow their product, deepen the impact that they're creating, um, and also, um, continue to give their employees a, a richer experience, um, year after year. Great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. So, um, that's, that's the main part in terms of the, the, the questions. Uh, we'd like to now move to the fast five questions for both of you to answer. Are you guys good to go? Good to go. Yes. I'm, I'm going to ask you first, Angela, uh, what was your first job? I was off actually an office assistant for a Japanese credit card company. A lot of that involved every month I would have to stuff hundreds of envelopes with the merchant invoices. Um, so it was a mix of origami and trying to avoid paper cuts. <laughs> And, and Ivy, what about you? Equally as glamorous, I was at KFC selling chicken after school. I did that job for three years. Still a fan favourite. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> yeah. going to knock KFC. No, um, who doesn't love what's KFC? Some, yeah, I, I reckon. Look, there are people out there. Uh, won't name them, but there are people out there. <laughs> what's something interesting that's not on your CV? Uh, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I actually represented Hong Kong in women's cricket. Uh, so I'm a big cricket fan, big cricket tragic. Um, and yeah, I, I, yeah, I played <laughs> when I was in Hong Kong. Yeah. Did, did not see that coming. So definitely <laughs> something interesting and surprising. Ivy. Uh, well, something that's not on my CV, I'm actually a qualified masseuse. So I worked as a remedial massage therapist to supplement my income when I was a social worker. Oh, wow. Okay. I, f I feel like I'm really getting to know you guys here. And, and, and just, you know, for, for out of fairness, my first official job was selling fish and chips at Parramatta Westfield. Um, nice. And the only reason I got that job was to save enough money to buy an outfit for my year 10 formal. Oh, wow. And that outfit was atrocious. So I was totally, I don't know what I was thinking. 
Um, Angela, <laughs> what advice would you give to your 18 year old self? I would tell 18 year old Angela to really invest in networks and um, build relationships and the importance of finding and, and um, getting advice from mentors. Um, for me, I would tell my 18 year old self, uh, guess what? You don't actually need to figure out what you want to do when you grow up because it's going to change in ways that you can't imagine. So all you need to do is be open to, to that. What book is a must read or what movie is a must watch? So a recent book that I read that I would highly recommend is Behind the Cloud um, by Mark Benioff. Um, he, it's the story of the founder of Salesforce. It's a great book about how to build a business, a game-changing technology business. And also Salesforce and Mark Benioff had a real game-changer approach to CSR. And so I would recommend it on, for both, um, both those reasons. And I would love to recommend Half the Sky by Nicholas Kristof and Cheryl Wooden. I guarantee this book will change the way you see the world. Um, after you read this, it's impossible to not live your life with a social lens and want to be part of the change. It is just impossible. So it's a great recommend, a great book. I highly recommend it. We're, we're building up a great repository of books of must read. Uh, I think by the end of this season, we will publish a blog to say, you know, these are the recommended books from our speakers. So. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, and, and lastly, this is the last question here is what's a job for the future that doesn't exist today? Uh, so right now, a lot of us I know are stuck um, and had holidays canceled. So I think a job for the future would be a space travel agent. One way to uh, avoid the COVID restrictions is to <laughs> all start doing intergalactic travel. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I like the idea that we're probably going to need some social media archivists. So people who get paid to collect and preserve the Instagram posts and tweets, which are deemed to have a long-term value. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Angela and Ivy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for being our first double guest episode. Uh, really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kai. Thank you, Kai. Our guests today were Angela Kwan and Ivy Robinson, co-founders of Catalyzer, a female-led tech company backed by Telstra and EY. The co-founders wanted to create something that has a social impact, but can also be commercially scalable, global, and innovative. Catalyzer is a certified B Corporation, a global stamp of approval, recognizing their high standards of social and environmental performance and commitment to use business as a force for good. You can learn more about Catalyzer by visiting their website, you can also connect with the co-founders, Angela and Ivy, on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening to the HR Think Tank with Kai Node. We'd love it if you could subscribe and share our podcast with your network. As always, the resources and links mentioned will be included in the show notes and posted on the Verify Now website, verifynow.com.au.